Thank you. If you take your Bibles with me and turn to the book of Habakkuk, we will go to the second chapter and we'll be reading from verses 4 through to 20. One said, uh, John, when John MacArthur was preaching on, on the book of Habakkuk, he started off by saying, happiness is sitting next to somebody that knows where Habakkuk is in the Bible. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it's one of the small books that you can very quickly, quickly t- turn by if you, if you find it. It's just after Nahum, if that might be helpful. I'm reading from verse 4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. He also, because he transgressed by wine, he is a proud man. Neither keepeth at home, who enlarges his desire as hell, and is as death and cannot be satisfied, but gathered unto him all nations and heapeth unto him all people. Shall not all these take up a parable against him and taunting uh, taunting prophet against him and say, Woe to him that increases that which is not his. How long? And to him that laden himself with thick clay. Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and awake that shall vex thee and thou shalt be for booties unto them because thou hast spoiled spoiled many nations and the remnant of the people shall spoil thee because of men's blood and for the violence of the land, of the city, and of all that dwells therein. Woe to him that covet an evil contentiousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and a sin against thy soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood, and establishes a city by iniquity. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire, and the people shall weary themselves for very vanity. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters covers the sea. Woe unto him that gives his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, and makes him drunk also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink, drink thou also, and let thy foreskins be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be only thy glory. For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee, and the spoil of the beast which made them afraid, because of men's blood, and for the violence of the land, of the city, and all that dwells therein. What profit the graven image? that the maker thereof had graven it, the molten image and the teacher of lies, that the maker of his work trusted therein to make dumb idols. Woe unto him that says to wood, awake, to the dumb stone, arise. It shall teach, behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, And there is no breath at all in the midst of it. But the Lord 
is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Heavenly Father, as we come to this passage, Lord, we ask that you would help us, Father. Lord, we're not interested in quaint little stories or things that can keep us interested for worldliness sake lord our interest is in thee and thee alone our interest is like we sung in that hymn earlier to know our savior more and more and father that's what we ask of thee this evening that you would help us help us lord to hear your word help us as we read these great truths in your written word that our hearts may be moved that our hearts may be stirred to do more for Jesus, the one who gave everything for us. Oh Lord, please help us now as we consider the words that have been written here. Help us to understand it. Help me to preach it faithfully and accurately. And I pray, Lord, that you would help my brothers and sisters to have hearts of understanding, ears that would hear the truth of your word, And above all things, Father, that we may in our day-to-day lives be enabled by your Holy Spirit to apply these things as we go about our Christian lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it's been a couple of months, really, since we've been in the book of Habakkuk. You'll remember we've covered uh, up to verse 3 in the first two sermons that we had on the passage. And just to refresh refresh your memory, Habakkuk lived in the last couple of years before the exile into Babylon. And uh, all that we know about the prophet is contained in this this little book. So there's not much externally that we can understand about the prophet's life, but we can discern where and when it is that he he ministered. Um, And Habakkuk had a difficulty. He, He was really burdened. For the state of his nation. And I think that's something that we all can, to some extent, at very least, resonate with at the moment. Isn't we're all burdened with the choices that our leaders are making. We're burdened as we consider the direction that our nation is taking. I think it's a burden that is carried, you know, across the Western world at the moment, as our governments in the West turn further and further from the truth that made these nations great in which we live. Turning from Christ, and as a result, we're turning from the one truth that it can hold us together as a people. And Habakkuk was experiencing this reality in his day. And as he looked at the sin and the struggles that he saw round about him, he ended up pleading in prayer before God. And the pleading that he had before God effectively became the book of Habakkuk as the prophet engaged engaged in a lament before God and God actually answered his prayers. And we saw the first prayer uh, that Habakkuk uttered before the Lord to summarize it. Basically, he said, we're not going to cover everything we covered in the first sermon. But basically, he said, Why does the Lord allow so much evil to exist in the world, in his nation specifically? And and it's very much the same question that we address today, isn't it? I I don't know how you find it, but these days when we're on the street ministering to people, you don't often engage with individuals that say science is a a problem to religion. You do get them. But I think the, the question that I get asked most of the time is if there is a good God, why does so many evil things happen in the world? It's a question we get over and over again. And if there's one book in the Bible that answers that position, it is the book of Habakkuk. And that's why it is a very important book for us today. And we covered some of that in our first two messages. Our second messages, message, we saw that the Lord in, 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 in Habakkuk's first reply, uh, you know, play, first plea replied to him that by saying that I am going to do something. I'm going to do something that nobody will believe that uh, even if they were told it. And 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 that that response of the Lord was that He was going to raise up the Chaldeans as an instrument 
of his punishment over his people. And that created the second dilemma that, that Habakkuk had. You know, so now suddenly the, Habakkuk started considering, well, how can God raise up a people that is so much more evil than, than, than the Jews that they almost make the Jews look like righteous people in comparison? How can he use an evil people like that as his means of judge, judgment? You know, and that, that brings us to a second dilemma that we face today as well, isn't it? Because often people will say, still today, say, well, how can God use unrighteous means to achieve his own righteous goals? But sometimes I think we just need to backtrack a little bit and ask ourselves, well, who am I? You know, are each and every one of us not unrighteous means before Christ enters into our lives and chains us and we find the ability to stand now in his righteousness, but not our own? You know, so in that regard, each and every one of us, to some extent, is being used by God to fulfill his purposes, even though in and of ourselves we are the unrighteous means that he should use in those instances. But by the work of Christ, we are sanctified. Now, for the Chaldeans, this wasn't the case. The Chaldeans were indeed a wicked people. And, and we, we saw that in chapter 1. We saw how, how the, the prophet really struggled with what was going on there and how he had to bring him back to the certainty of who God is. You remember in the second, second sermons, we focused on that first verse where he says, I will stand upon my watch and set myself upon the tower, and I will watch and see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. So he was ready to stand on the truth that he knows about God. You know, and something I, I missed and didn't say in our, our previous message was, as Christians, that's really what we should do as well, isn't it? When we face a difficult time, often we should take a step back. We should take a step back and say, well, what is it that I know about my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? What do I know about God? And then we should stand firm on those truths as we face the uncertainties that the world will throw, throw at us. And that's what the prophet did. And as the prophet did that, the Lord came and gave him his answer. And this is what we're considering this evening, the answer that the Lord gives Habakkuk in why, why he would use an unrighteous means like this as his means of justice. And first of all, the first thing that the Lord says is that these people who he will use to fulfill his purposes will not go unpunished themselves. It says in verse 4, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. So, he has nothing to stand on. That soul that is lifted up in himself has no solid ground on which to stand effectively. And you, 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 you can remember how he said uh, that, that this, this was a nation that was so full in his own conceit, full of his own proud pride, pride and ability that they started praising their own power. You remember how it said that they, they, they grabbed in all the nations as with a net, as a fisherman goes out with a net to grab in the nations, so does the Chaldeans go to gather all the nations unto themselves. And says they then go and pray and praise and burn incense to their nets. So ultimately starting to worship their own power, their own ability. And as a result, the Lord says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. You know, and I wonder sometimes, we as, as believers, as professing believers, what do we stand on in this life? You know, do we stand on our own abilities? Do we go around looking at how good we are at certain things or how much we're able to do in our own strength? You know, it's a terrifying thought, isn't it? Especially when we do the, the Lord's work. Is I can, can remember there was there was a, Old Chinese missionary, I want to, it's, it's possible that Pastor Derek told us the story, but uh, old, old, old missionary that worked in, uh, that, that worked in China and, and some, some people became Christians and he took some of them over to America 
and this 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 Chinese individual was interviewed on a American uh, Christian Christian radio station, and he was asked, "What is it that struck you most about Christianity in America?" And the individual answered and said, "How much the Americans can achieve for Christ without the Holy Spirit." You know, and that's a terrifying thought, isn't it? Because we 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 have been made in God's image. We have a mind we can apply ourselves, but do we really want to apply ourselves in our own strengths? No, we need to apply ourselves in the strengths that God has brought before us and in His strength and His abilities. And that is why prayer is so important. That is why we encouraging everyone here to pray as much as we can and making opportunities for that so that we can be known as a people of prayer. He says, Behold, his soul is lifted up, and it's not upright in him. But, isn't it wonderful? I love all the buts we see in, 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 in the Bible, isn't it? You, you always get, you know, kind of doom and gloom, but then God gives us a but. But the righteous, the just shall live by faith. Isn't that a tremendous contrast, isn't it? So you have the unbeliever, those who are conceited in themselves, standing in their own strength, standing in their own abilities, and the warning that we have as believers not to stand in our own strength, and then the reminders that the just shall live by faith. Isn't that amazing that we have that testimony all the way back here, all the way back before the, the Jews were taken into exile, the gospel is proclaimed to us that the just shall live by faith. You know, that passage can, can, can very, very, very well read in Hebrew as well, that the justified can live by faith. And we know how we are justified. You know, that is one of those key theolog theological terms that we, that we need to fully understand. I can rem remember when I was younger in, in Sunday school, um, we we had we I grew up Afrikaans in the Dutch Reformed Church, but we had one teacher that was a, a English speaking lady that also, o, often came in, and she one day stood there and said to us, you know, the term justified. So he's teaching us several several terms in English, and saying the term justified in the Bible, you can you can understand that by considering it's the same as just as though you've never sinned. You know, and that always stuck with me. And when I came to the UK, I realized that many other people were told that, taught, taught that precept. But actually, it's not an accurate term. It's not an accurate description for the term. Because the reality is, brothers and sisters, you and I will never be as though we've never sinned. You know, first and foremost, we see the marks of our sin upon the cross. We see the marks of our sin upon the cross where Jesus Christ died to bear our sin upon himself. You know, and furthermore, if you were alcoholic or you struggled with drugs in your life, you're going to have consequences in the rest of your life. You might suffer with liver failure or you might suffer with other illnesses. But that's as a result of sin. You see, the word justifies is a legal term. It means that we are declared to be legally right with God. God has taken the action God has done something so that we can be declared right with God. And that is why the prophet says that the just shall live by faith. You know, Paul takes up, takes up that, that, that same, same idea, and it's probably exa exactly the passage he's quoting when he, when he speaks uh, ab about, about justification in Romans 1 verse 7. And Paul in the book of Romans in the first two and a half chapters, does everything he can to show us how, how, how in bondage people are to sin. You know, regardless whether you're religious or regardless whether you are a professing atheist, you are one who stands guilty before God. And he says in verse 17 of the first chap chapter, he says the following, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You know, he after, after he labors on that whole concept, he comes to uh, chapter 3 of the book of Romans, and he now presents the fullness of the gospel 
to us when he explains this term in verse 21, when he now says, but now the righteousness of God. So in other words, the rightness of God, the fact that God is always right. He's always perfect in all his decisions. He's, he's, he, there is no wrong to be found in our God. And he says, because of that, the righteousness of God in verse 21 without the law is manifested being witnessed by the laws and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the position that Paul defined in his first first two chapters of the book of Romans. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but are being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So in other words, they have been declared to be right with God through the redemption to the fact that Christ Jesus brought us back unto himself with the precious price of his very own blood. And that's the first thing we see in, in this, this, this second answer that the Lord gives the prophet. He says, I'm going to deal with the Chaldeans, but you know this for sure. The just shall live by faith. And you know, I think that's something we should remember as believers today. You know, as we look to all the things that are happening all around us, as we get concerned perhaps about what's the fuel price going to be next week, or as we start worrying, you know, is my budget still going to hold out with, with the amount I allocate for my feud? How much should I allocate for my tithing? All those things. Is all of this stuff going to need to change as the prices go up and up and up? We need to remember that God is in control. And the just shall live by faith. And what does that look like, brothers and sisters? That, that, that is the reality of the Christian life, isn't it? We move forward knowing that our Savior is sufficient. He's the one who bought us. He's the one who will sustain us. He's the one who will keep us. I remember um, a guy called William Grunel. I don't have the quote with me now, but it's a quote that I'll love love from him and it's going to be a, a terrible par paraphrase but he said in 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 his book uh, a book that he wrote the christian in complete armor he said the following he said if god spent that much to purchase you how certain can you not be that he will keep apply all his power to keep you as a believer and isn't that a wonderful thought brothers and sisters to think of this god gave you his son his son died for you on that tree, swallowing up all your sin as you put your hope upon him and then presented his righteous life to you. Now, if God did all of that for you, how much more will he not keep you? I mean, think of your most pre precious, precious possession in your home. Now, as Christians, most of us probably don't put too much emphasis on the stuff we own, but I think everybody's got Maybe that's something, maybe it's a family heirloom, maybe it's something, a Bible somebody give you, gave you at one point that you really love and you, you, you look after, you cherish it, and you pay, you, you, you pay a lot of attention in keeping it in good condition and stuff like that. How much more will the eternal God not employ His power to keep you who have been bought by the blood of His Son? You know, and that's why we can stand. That is why we can stand in the midst of all these calamities and troubles that go on around us. That's why as believers, we should not fret, but we should live by faith. Faith that the God who saved us is also able to keep us. And, the pro you know, the prophet then starts alluding to all the things that will happen. He says these the, the king, he, he refers specifically to the king of, 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 of the Chaldeans. Uh, may, some commentators speculate that he refers to the power behind the king, which is Satan himself. But whichever you, way you look at it, all of it comes together. And it's, it, it actually brings it to that point where he says, shall not all of those who have been taken by this king actually get together and use 
a, a proverb, a taunting proverb against him and say, woe to him that increases that which is not his. You know, we need to remember this, whatever perspective the world have, whatever perspective the world leaders have, none of these things belong unto them. Listen, all things belong unto our God. He's mighty and he's able to deal with all of the things going on to this world. And so doing, the very people who they took and conquered were the people that rose up and started taunting them and, and, and turned against them, saying, woe to him that increases that which is not, on, not his own. He actually pronounces five woes throughout this passage. Woe to him that coveteth an evil generation. Woe to him that builded a, t a town with blood and established a city with iniquity. Woe unto him that gives his neighbor drink and put a bottle to him. Woe unto him that says to wood arise and to dumb stone arise. You just see it spiraling further and further out of control. And I think we don't have to look high and far to see the realities in, in, in our own, own time how people are trusting more and more in stuff that they've designed themselves. Listen, how much hope that people not have nowadays in the medical systems and things that's going on. We as Christians, I'm not saying we shouldn't have hope in the medical systems. God has given, given man brilliant minds, and, and, and we've got some brilliant Christian doctors out there doing wonderful things. But ultimately, where does your hope and trust lie? Are you looking unto things that are created, or are you looking unto the Creator Himself? It's foolish, isn't it, to look, look at things that were created rather than the Creator Himself. But we see, we see in verse, let me just find the verse, verse, verse 14, the Lord, the Lord speaks to the prophet, and He assures the prophet that uh, in verse 14, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What a wonderful certainty is that not that's being presented in the midst of all this calamity, isn't it? You know, that the Lord will be sovereign. His glory will be over all the earth. You know, it reminds me, reminds me of chapter, chapter 6 in, in, in Isaiah, when Isaiah comes into the presence of of, of the Lord, you know, he, Isaiah actually, you look, look at the book of Isaiah and some con commentators would refer to it and say that chapter six is actually at the wrong place. This chapter six should very much be the first chapter because that's where Isaiah receives his commissioning. But as we know, God's word is perfect. And, and, and we know, we see with the prophet Isaiah that it announces that he actually started his ministry during the reign, the reign of Amaziah and oh, oh, sorry of, of, of Uzziah and not just at his death. So he could have been ministering for several years during the reign of Uzziah. And he had from chapter one through to chapter five, very much a, a glooming message for the people. But in this message, there's always this thread of judgment and salvation as it's presented side by side. And you can any one of us that minister, when we go out and we preach the gospel to people on the street, our hope is not to shout condemnation unto the world. Our hope is that people would hear the words of our Savior and come to Christ. And, and I'm sure that was the hope of Isaiah as well. And yet in chapter 5, you see the climax of his work ending up to this place where Isaiah had to also write, I think it's seven or eight woes. To, to, to the people of Judah because they remained unrepentant. And so much so that in chapter 6, he had to have a new revelation of the glory of God. And, and it says there that as the Lord appeared to him, he saw the Lord seated high and, and lifted up. And he said his train filled the temple and his glory was all over the temple. And it represents the same fact that's being presented to the, to the prophet here that the glory of the, the knowledge of, of the glory of the Lord will be over all the seas and over all the waters, will fill the earth. 
And that's a promise we should hang on to as believers, isn't it? You know, when we go out there and we feel discouraged, when you, when you go to school or when you go to work and you think people are just not listening to what I have to say or they think I'm irrelevant because I'm a Christian, know this, that our Lord will reign supreme. That day when every knee will bow before Him is coming. And we pray that people will recognize the Savior so that it will bow out of awe and adoration and not because He rules the nation with a rod of iron and He will break the legs of those who do not bow to Him. And we, we have this Lord. We have a God whose knowledge will cover all of the earth. But in, the, in, in verse 19, in the midst of that, it leads on to this fact that even, even though this truth will be prevalent and no one can desire it, because there's an inward testimony to everyone. You know, and this is why I think as believers, we shouldn't, we shouldn't allow people who profess atheists to take the weapon of the word of God away from us when we say, yeah, okay, I believe you that you're atheist. When God's word clearly tells us that there's no such thing. It says, for all people know that there is a God. And they become unable to see them because they suppress the truth of God through their own unrighteousness. But we believe them when they say that they are atheists. We believe Big John. I know we don't, but sometimes the way we engage with them might seem like we believe them. You know, the knowledge of the Lord is over all the earth. They have that knowledge. But as they suppress it more and more, they eventually get to that place where they will say to a piece of wood, awake. Where they will say to a dumb stone, arise. And will eventually call to it for, to it to teach them. You know, this can be related to so many different areas, isn't it? Whether, whether somebody is a petrol head and he worships his vehicles or whether he's worshiping his girlfriend or whether he's worshiping his own body as he goes to the gym for seven, eight hours a day. What is it that we look to and say, arise and give me life? You know, I thank God that by his grace and mercy, he has brought us as, as believers to that place where we can say, but the Lord is in his holy temple. You know, it doesn't matter what you say or what you believe or what you per per perceive in this world. I can tell you one thing is true right now, and that is that the Lord is in, the, in his holy te temple. And let all the earth keep silence before him. You know, the prophet is, is being reminded there by God himself that he is sovereign over all things. He is over all things. He is in control of all things. And the time will come when everything in this world will yield in submission to Him. And that's why it says there, let all the earth be silent before Him. Now, my brothers and sisters, we belong to Him. How much more should you and I not bow the knee in reverence before our holy God? I don't know your hearts. I don't know where you find yourself or where you are in your journey with your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But one thing I will ask you now is, do you know that the Lord is sovereign? Do you know that you have an opportunity now to come in silence before him and acknowledge him for who he is? And I pray that you do that now because the day is coming when you will no longer have a choice, but it will be too late. And you will face God's justice. And he is extending his mercy to you. Do not harden your heart against his mercy. For his mercy and compassion is great and it knows no end. You've seen his mercy and compassion on the cross as he took all our sin upon himself. So do not harden your hearts today because the word of God says today is the day of salvation. So my brothers and sisters, whether we have hardened our hearts in certain areas of sin or whether we have persistently hardened our heart in rejecting the, rejecting the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, I will encourage you now, recognize this, that the Lord is in His, in His holy temple and all the earth shall be silent before Him. Let us with that become silent before the Lord ourselves. Heavenly Father, 
We thank you for your grace and mercy, Lord. We thank you for the way you dealt with your people throughout all the ages, that you've shown yourself mighty. But not only, Father, have you shown yourself mighty, you've shown your glory in the great compassion and mercy that you have bestowed unto the lost, unto those who were your enemies, Father of who each and every Christian in this world will confess that they were first among those who hated and rebelled against you. But in your divine mercy, you changed them. You came into their hearts and made them aware of their sin and their need to repent and to put their hope and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you that you've brought us to that place. And we pray for anyone who have not done that as yet, Father, that they may repent, that they may recognize that they have rebelled and sinned against a holy God, but a holy God who's been so merciful and kind that he would send his one and only son to live the perfect life and go to the cross and take our sin upon himself. Oh Lord, as we grow in our understanding of your mercies and your might and your majesty, we will throughout all generations and throughout all eternity come back to this one tremendous truth that Christ Jesus died for us. And Lord, we will be overwhelmed. I pray, Lord, that we would be overwhelmed with that right now, that we may recognize, Father, that you are gracious and compassionate and that your mercy is so much higher than we could ever, ever imagine. Lord, please help us to come to terms with these wonderful truths so that our hearts may overflow with thanksgiving. Lord, reminded how you in your word said that they who much have been forgiven of so will give much thanks. And we want to be those people who recognize how much we've been forgiven for so that our hearts may pour over with thanks. Lord, please. We pray that you would show us what we've been saved from, that you would show us what we still need to be saved on, and that you would reveal to us more and more of who you are so that we may have more and more of Jesus every day of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.